My name is Kelly Masters. I'm the president of Homemade Texas, um, the organization that is presenting this um, this, this slideshow to you tonight. Um, I have a paralegal degree, and I have to tell you that the first lesson in paralegal school is to learn to say this, I'm not a lawyer and I can't give you legal advice. And so I learned my lesson in paralegal school. So I'm not a lawyer and none of what you're about to see is legal advice. The source of my expertise is the fact that I have been involved in every cottage food law that's been passed um, or not passed since uh, 2009 in Texas. And so um, if you ask a question that I don't know the answer to or that might call for um, a, a more legal interpretation, um, I might refer you to DSHS for that. All righty. So let me see. Oh, good. Um, when I was preparing this slide, um, it kind of took me back in time about 10 years. And so I wanted, hopefully you'll think this is interesting like I do, but um, a in 2011, it was our second attempt to pass a cottage food law and the cottage food law died. It was killed in the local and consent committee by the Harris County Health Department and the members of the Harris County delegation. Um, the chair of the House Public Health Committee at that time was Lois Kolkhorst. She's now a senator. So I might go back and forth between calling her Chair Kolkhorst and Senator Kolkhorst, but she was our champion. She was determined to pass the cottage food law. And so she at attached the language from the cottage food law to another bill as a second reading amendment. And a couple of years later, I saw Senator Kolkhorst at a, uh, at a, at a show, she was uh, giving a speech. And I think the, the words she used were that after she attached that amendment, it was pandemonium because the Harris County Health Department thought they had killed this bill and she had pulled this surprise and revived it at the last minute. And so they brought her a third reading amendment and third reading amendments are very rare. And I'm not exactly clear why, but she felt that she had to take this amendment. So on third reading, she attached this amendment. It was, it was very fast. There was not a lot of time to review it thoroughly. It was kind of the fog of war kind of situation, but the amendment added labeling and it prohibited internet sales and uh, what wasn't even noticed until later was that they had struck out farmers markets from these sales locations. And that was devastating to the farmers. Um, so cottage foods could only be sold from the home from 2011 to 2013. So there was this hastily added labeling requirement that no one had really vetted. It had just kind of been stuck on there at the last minute to try to pass the bill. And what it said was that the executive commissioner of DSHS shall adopt rules requiring a cottage food production operation to label all of the foods in the cottage food law that they sell. And it said the label must include the name and ad address of the cottage food production operation and a statement that the food is not inspected by the department or a local health department. So you might notice that that instructed the Department of State Health Services or DSHS to write rules. And these are the only rules they got to write about the cottage food law because of the way this amendment was worded and the way the cottage food law was set up. So they set about writing rules to, <clears throat> to implement this. And it was a catastrophe. Um, they... I can't, I can't say why they did what they did, and it's not fair to attribute hostility to their motives. So what I will say in the absence of hostility is that they were bureaucrats and they had no sense of proportion or perspective. They couldn't see the forest for the trees. And they wrote rules for Nabisco as, as if we were Nabisco when the entire point of the cottage food law is that we're not Nabisco. So they wrote this horrible set of label, proposed labeling rules um, that had the name and physical address of the cottage food production operation, the common or usual name of the product, and an adequately descriptive statement of identity 
if made from two or more ingredients, a list of ingredients in descending order of predominance by net weight, including a declaration of artificial color or flavor and chemical preservatives if contained in the food. An accurate declaration of the net quantity of contents, including metric measurements, Allergen labeling and compliance with the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act of 2004, Pub L number 108-82, Title II, it goes on and on and on. Uh, the following statement, made in a home kitchen, comma, food is not inspected by the Department of State Health Services or a local health department in at least the equivalent of 11 point font and in a color that provides a clear contrast to the background. Labels must be clearly legible and printed with durable permanent ink, which many people believed would have precluded the use of even inkjet printers. Ingredient statements shall be at 1 16th of an inch or larger. So now we're getting into kind of a contradiction, like they said 11 points up, up earlier, and now they say 1 16th of an inch. So which one is it? Ingredients shall include components of the ingredients and the net quantity of contents shall be separated from the other text on the label and must be located in the bottom third of the label. When DSHS proposed these rules, I will say all hell broke loose. Uh, the media that had been kind of behind us championing, championing the cottage food bill, uh, a bunch of them came and ran stories about the proposed rules and how terrible they were. Um, I testified at an interim hearing of the House Public Health Committee, and uh, Chair Kolkhorst was mad, and the entire committee was mad, and I watched them metaphorically take the head off the poor guy from DSHS's Intergovernmental Affairs who had just happened to be there that day, and it's been 10 years, and I still feel sorry for that guy because they were so hard on him, and he didn't write the rules, but he was stuck there defending them. Chair Kolkhorst wrote a letter to the Commissioner of um, Health and Human Services with her own um, with her own marked up copy of the rules as she thought they should be, and if you can see these they're just hilarious because she's marked out practically everything except for the name and physical address of the cottage food operation. Um, and so it was almost like the cottage food battle part two. It was like trying to pass the cottage food law again. Um, and so we submitted comments just like you do through rulemaking processes. And then we had to wait and hope that we had done enough. And when they finally came out with their final rules, it was okay. Um, the only two things that they added that weren't actually in the statute were the common or usual name of the product and a list of any of the major food allergens, which uh, as a parent of a child with a food allergy, I can't really argue with that. And they backed off all of that stuff about the requirements for, uh, you know, contrasting ink and point sizes, font sizes, and, and 1 16th of an inch. And they just said labels must be le legible. So that is where we are. The rules that we have today are very similar, but they are like the grandchild of, of those first rules back in 2012. So that's where we started. And that's kind of what we're still working with. So moving on to the current rules, the label shall include, there's four major things that need to be on your labels. The name and physical address of the cottage food production operation, that is in the statute. The common or usual name of the product, disclosure of any major food allergens, um, the following statement, that's your statement of non-inspection, this food is made in a home kitchen, and hasn't been inspected and the labels must still be legible. Okay, and I wanted to talk about packaging for a minute because packaging and labeling kind of go hand in hand because um, you have to put the label on the package typically. Um, the, the law says all foods prepared by an operator shall be packaged and labeled in a matter, in a manner that prevents product contamination. So what that means is, um, you can use any kind of material. Don't let a health inspector say it has to be a plastic clamshell or it has to be this certain kind. It, as long as it's preventing your product from being becoming contaminated, you can use cellophane or 
or glassine or just paper or cardboard, you know, whatever works. It can get really expensive. Shop around for the best price on that. Um, usually bags or or pouches are cheaper than boxes. Um, and I'd like to invite you guys to drop some links in the chat because I know probably a lot of you have uh, sources that, that you like to use. Um, Amazon is always there, of course, but it's not always the best price. Um, there's another one um, that a lot of people love called brpboxshop.com. Um, and go ahead and just, um, if you don't mind, uh, leave your favorite uh, supplier there in the comments. Sometimes people ask, um, do I have to put a label on every package? For instance, if I made a hundred cake pops and I wrapped each one in its own little baggie and then I put them all in a box, can I just put one label on the box? This is not addressed in the statute or the rules, but I think the way I read it, that you need to put a label on every package. And the reason I think that is because of this line that I've highlighted in yellow. It says all foods prepared by an operator shall be packaged and labeled. So I think if you've got 100 cake pops, then you need 100 labels on those cake pops. And try to not think of it as as much of a chore as a way to advertise. You know, if those are being given away as favors at a wedding, then you've just put your advertising information in a hundred hands. Now, there are some items that are not required to be packaged. If an item, and this is from the statute, if an item is too large or bulky for conventional packaging, the labeling inf information can be provided on the item's invoice. So what this applies to is big things or really awkward things like wedding cakes, cupcake bouquets, a croquembouche, a sculpted cake that's, you know, got things going everywhere. If there's no good box for it, you don't have to try to find a box for it. And in that case, just put your labeling information on the invoice and you can hand it to the customer. And just a note, one time I was in a group and someone said something to the effect of if I bought my ingredients in bulk, then I don't have to put a label on my food. And I realized that that's how she had interpreted that word bulky. So that's not what that means. Bulky just means big and awkward. Um, it has nothing to do with how you are purchasing your uh, ingredients. Okay. All right, let's move on to the four things that must be on your cottage food labels, the name and the physical address. There's no exception to this rule. I know it's not popular, um, but that is in the statute that's been in the statute since, since, you know, back when the first law passed in 2011 with that third reading amendment, your name can be your personal or your business name. Sometimes people ask, can I put a PO box on it? And the answer is no, because the statute says it has to be your physical address where the food is prepared. Now, this goes for everything I'm about to say. You can add information to your labels. You can add anything you want. Um, you can add a phone number, email, website, but those are not a substitute for your home address. You still have to include the physical address. And on that note, Remember I said back from 2011 to 2013, uh, cottage foods could only be sold from the home. Um, at, for two years, the customer was required to visit uh, your home at some point during the transaction. That has not been the case since we expanded the law in 2013. So there is no reason for the customer to have to come to your home. And a lot of people are working from home now, you know, since COVID. So practice good home security if you're working at home, whether it's cottage food or anything else. Use caution opening the door. If it's a stranger, maybe don't open the door. Um, my husband always thinks he has to open the door and he laughs at me. We have like a window by the door and sometimes if I don't know the person, I'll just open the window and I'll peek out at them and he, he thinks that's weird and I'm like, well, it's my house. I don't have to open the door. You don't have to open the door to someone you don't know. 
you could always meet your new customers in a public safe transaction spot. A lot of police uh, stations or libraries will have places that are well lit that you can meet a stranger um, that, that is more secure than having them come to your home. And lastly, this is not popular, um, and I understand why I don't particularly like it. Um, we are looking to have this amended in 2013 if we can pass um, a cottage food bill with some changes. There are some other states who are finding ways to um, address traceability of the food, but taking the home address off the label. The second thing that you must have on your labels is the common or usual name of the product. And this is easy. Don't overthink it. Just imagine you're at a market and the customer walks up and says, oh, what's this? And whatever you respond, if you say these are blueberry muffins or this is pecan granola, that is the uh, common or usual name of the product. Um, Jen McKee, how legible does the address have to be? Um, oh, gosh, it's not. Oh, there we go. Um, and I would say legible. Um, you know, a, a, your average person should be able to read it. it. It shouldn't be hard to read. Now we're on to the disclosure of major allergens. And um, this is one of the, the more difficult ones to comply with, just as far as having to do all, all these different products. Um, so you're required to disclose eggs, nuts, soy, peanuts, milk, wheat, fish, or selfish if they are used in your product. These are called, the FDA calls them the big eight and they are responsible for about 90% of food allergies. However, people can be allergic to other foods as well. So there's still 10% of food allergies that are not attributable to those. If you want to address that, you can print a list of ingredients on your label. It's not required but it does fulfill the requirement because if you have a list of all ingredients, then of, obviously you've disclosed any allergens that are used. But also if you have a list of ingredients, you've disclosed any potential allergens that are not in the big eight. Like my daughter has a friend who comes to sleep with us, uh, sleep, spend the night with us sometimes who's allergic to pineapple and we'd love pineapple in our house. And then that's not what, that's not one of the big eight. So some people say the ingredient list is a best practice. Um, I'm, I'm ambivalent on it. You're not required to, but it customers do appreciate it, okay? What you should not do is just put a statement on there that your food may contain any or all of these allergens. I had someone say to me once, well, if anybody's allergic to anything, I just want them to stay away from my food. So there's a few reasons that you should not just put that statement on there that it may contain anything. Well, first of all, it doesn't meet the labeling requirements because the uh, labeling requirements say you have to disclose the ingredient if it's actually used, not that it might be used. Second of all, it's probably not true. So don't make your labels <laughs> untrue about your food. However, remember what I said, you can add anything to your labels. So you can add a statement to your labels that the food may have contact, uh, come into contact with those allergens or any other allergens. And sometimes I do that, especially if I'm making something that I know is going to like a kid's party um, because children you know, tend to grow out of their allergies. My son did, uh, thank goodness, um, but, but that, that is a vulnerable population. All right, we have a couple of questions. Yvonne says, we have to add fish or shellfish. Um, if you, so in these this latest round of rulemaking that they did after the 2019 expansion, they did add fish and shellfish to the list of allergens that have to be disclosed because that's just rounding out the big eight. Um, I thought it was kind of silly, but then some people started pointing out to me that there actually are some ingredients that a cottage food operator might use that could contain those things like uh, Worcestershire sauce, you know, uh, it has anchovies in it, 
And there are some um, cake decorating products with like shimmer dust that actually are made with like uh, crustacean shells. So um, if, you, if you're talking about adding fish or shellfish, like if you have, uh, have pre-printed labels and you just have them on there um, and you just circle the allergen that's present, then you probably should. Unless you never, never would have a food that had that present in it, but um, on the off chance that you might, um, it would be, it would, if you're printing a lot of them, I would say yes. And if I didn't answer your question, Yvonne, feel free to clarify. All right, Peggy. What if you use a store-bought mix like Mrs. Wages Pickle Mix? Can you just put the name because she doesn't list all of her ingredients? You could. Remember, you're not required to have a list of ingredients. Um, and even if she doesn't, um, if, if the ingredients aren't listed on that, um, on that particular product, allergens should be on there. Um, so, you know, list, list it. <clears throat> to your, to, 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 to list it the best you can, um, you know, put, put all the information you have to make it easy for the customer. It's really all about making it easy for the customer to make a decision about whether this is something, you know, that they can buy and consume or not. Okay. Here's a question that has come up a couple of times. Um, People say, what if my food that I produced has no major allergens? And a really good example of that is jam, um, because jam does not typically have any of those big eight allergens. So you have two options there. Um, the, the rule says that if you used any of those big eight allergens, that you have to disclose them. If you didn't use them, then there's nothing to disclose. Um, you don't have to have those eight, uh, those big eight printed on every label and circle them. And if there's nothing to disclose about allergens, you can just leave that off. But I have done two sample labels here. Um, they're both correct. So you can leave them off in the example on the left side or on the right side, you could go ahead and still list the ingredients. And from a consumer standpoint, um, I can tell you I would be most likely to buy the product that was listed, that had all the ingredients listed. I mean, not, not only because of allergens, just because it makes it look more delicious. Blackberries, sugar, cornstarch, cinnamon, allspice, lemon juice. I would be saying, oh, that sounds so good. So um, you can go either way. There's nothing to disclose. There's nothing to disclose. Or you can just um, list the ingredients. What you should not do is say something like no allergens or, you know, N.A. or allergens, none, because you can't say that people can be allergic to anything. Right. With that, that 10 percent that's um, not covered by the big eight. So don't say none. Never say none. Um, I really do think in this case, probably a listing of the ingredients is the best way to go. All right. Let's talk about the statement of non-inspection. Um, so here is the statement. This food is made in a home kitchen and is not inspected by the Department of State Health Services or a local health department. So the first thing I'll say about that is it's slightly better than the first one that DSHS proposed back in 2012, which was horrible grammar. It was a sentence fragment. It started with made in a home kitchen, comma, food is not inspected. So we did get them to actually write a complete sentence. But I don't care for this sentence because it makes it sound like they're inspecting all food. And that's not what the health department does. They don't go to a restaurant and stand in the back and inspect all the food as it goes out the door, right? They inspect facilities. And you're lucky if they get out there once a year. So uh, it makes it sound like <laughs> your food is somehow deficient because the health inspector hasn't put their you know, seal of approval on it. 
So while I don't love this statement, it is still the statement. Um, your label has to contain this statement. Exactly. This is not a time to get creative. Um, all of us could write a better sounding statement, okay? <laughs> and, I, and I have actually seen some, like once my daughter went to an after school running club and the gym teacher's sister was a cottage food operator and made cute little running shoes for all the, the kids that were in this club. I mean, it was adorable and it was so sweet. And it, and it did have a cottage food label on it, but she had completely rewritten the statement of non-inspection. <laughs> I thought, wow, I, I, I didn't even think people would do that. Um, and I have seen something like this. Um, this food was prepared by a certified food manager in a home kitchen that is not subject to inspection under the Texas cottage food law. That is an awesome sounding statement of non-inspection and it's more accurate than this food hasn't been inspected, but unfortunately it does not fulfill the rule because the rule says you have to print the, the top statement on your labels, okay? Um, I, I know, I don't like it. I hate I hate having to put that on my, my uh, food just because it, it, it's not accurate to me but it is what it is. All righty, we're gonna move on from the statement of non-inspection. The labels must be legible. Um, and so again, they dropped all that nonsense about some stuff having to be in the top third and certain font size and certain, you know, one sixteenth of an inch for the ingredients. Um, so there's no, no specific format just make sure that they're legible and easy to read. Um, there is a certain font size if you're selling fruits and vegetables, and we will get to that in a slide or two, okay? Um, if you can't fit all of your information on one label, um, feel free to split it up. There's no rule that says you can't split it up. And so something you might wanna think about doing is having like your name and address and the statement of non-inspection on one label. And then on another label, you could actually put the common or usual name of the product and the allergens. And so you could have a lot printed up of the um, name and address because they would go on everything. And then you could just make a custom label uh, for the, the name and the allergens. And a last note on this, um, I just say make it easy for the customer and please don't put the labels on the bottom of the food. <laughs> I, it's not a rule at all. It's just my opinion that um, that if you put it on the bottom, it looks like you're hiding it and it makes it harder for the customer to see. So I, I, I do think put it on the top, put it on the side where they can easily see it. Frozen fruits and vegetables, probably not too many people watching this um, sell frozen fruits and vegetables. This is more geared to the farmer. Um, in 2019, this was added to the cottage food law. And so if you're selling raw and uncut fruits and vegetables, it must include the following statement in at least 12 point font when sold. Safe handling instructions to prevent illness from bacteria, keep this food frozen until preparing for consumption. And it has to be on the label or on the invoice or receipt provided with the fruit or vegetables. And a little bit of trivia, this is the only time and temperature control safety food that is allowed under the cottage food law right now, at the moment. Alrighty, and for canned pickled or for fermented food, um, and that's acidified canned pickled or fermented, um, on the labels for those, you have to use, um, label the batch with a unique batch number. And I totally suggest just using the date as your batch number because it's always sequential and you can never get it mixed up. And um, a little bit of trivia about that, that does not apply to cucumber pickles because they were allowed from 2013 to 2019 um, before the, uh, this other acidified can pickled and fermented food was allowed. So those uh, cucumber pickles are not subject to this labeling requirement. Okay, health claims in advertising. Um, this is kind of a new one that DSHS stuck on there in 2019. 
um, probably doesn't apply to to many of you, but it says advertising media of cottage food products for health, disease, or other claims must be consistent with, consistent with those claims allowed by the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, Part 101, Subparts D and E. So health claims, those would be saying like it's a good source of calcium or low calorie, sugar-free, low sodium, may reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, you have to follow the, uh, the rules found in the Code of Feg Federal Regulations, otherwise known as the CFR. And those are found online. That's pretty easy these days. And I'm going to post a link to them down here in the comments where you are welcome to peruse the CFR subparts D and E, uh, specific requirements for nutrient content claims and specific requirements for health claims. But I really advise that unless for some reason you think it's essential that you market your food as having these benefits or you have someone with expertise in this field, just don't make any health claims about your food. <laughs> And then lastly, we're getting ready to wrap up and I just wanted to show you guys a few examples of labels. Um, and here are a couple that are wrong. And in the example on the left, Coco's Cookies, we've got the home address, we've got the common or usual name of the product and we've got the allergens. But then we have this statement, Coco's Cookies is a home-based business under the Texas Cottage Food Law and is not subject to inspections by the Texas Health Department. Again, that is an awesome sounding statement of non-inspection, but it is not the statement of non-inspection. So uh, that, that label would not technically be complying with the, uh, with the labeling requirements. And here on sugar and spice confections, uh, we've got a website and a phone number which has been substituted instead of the address. So already we can see that the address is missing. They've got the common or usual name of the product. And then down here, instead of saying which allergens that it contains, it just says may contain all these, these allergens. And may contain does not help anyone. Um, it does not help someone with allergies avoid your food. Um, and it's probably, as I said, not true. So um, that's why that label would not comply with the labeling rule. Right. And here's a couple that are right on. These would comply. Um, the Cozy Cottage Bake Shop. Here's our address. Common name is Blueberry Muffins. Contains the following allergens and the statement, this food is made in a home kitchen and not inspected by the Department of State Health Services or local health department. In Grammy Suites here on the right, we've got the address and we've got some added information. We've got the website and the phone number. That's allowed. You can add information to your labels. We've got the common or usual name of the product, Texas Sheet Cake. Instead of allergens, we have an ingredient listing, but of course that encompasses the allergens. So that is, um, that is in compliance with the rule. There's an added statement made in a facility that also processes peanuts and tree nuts. You can add that. And then the required statement of non-inspection. Okie dokie, Ma Michelle, let me see. Let's see. My computer is being very sluggish. Gluten-free products or vegan or items specifically made to be sugar-free. See, this is, um, this is one of those instances where I would say you would have to consult the, the CFR with those subchapters where I... Um, I put that link and see if there's any specific requirements that your food has to meet in order to make those claims. Okie dokie, and a few final notes. Um, there's no specific formatting on the labels. You can put the information in different places. You could put the statement of non-inspection at the top. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It just has to be legible. All my labels are just suggestions. Um, that's that's all they are. Um, you don't have to do it my way. You just have to make sure you have those four pieces of information on there. You have to have your name, physical address, common name of the food, and 
the allergens and this food is made in a home kitchen and not inspected by the Department of State Health Services or a local health department. Um, but if you go to, most of you probably have already been to texascottagefoodlaw.com um, slash labels. It's, it's one of the menu items right on the top. You can see a sample uh, label. It, it even points out all the components that are required. And this picture that I have here, um, come back. Uh, this is actually my label on uh, some of my boxes of sugar cookies. Um, and so I just thought you guys might want to see a real life example. Um, I, I put my logo on my labels because it's pretty and I think it makes the label look nicer. And my logo does contain uh, the name of my cottage food operation. So there's my name and my address and the common or usual name of the product, iced sugar cookies that turned out to, to be dual purpose. <laughs> These are the ones I found extras of this weekend. Contains the following allergens and then the statement of non-inspection. And in case you're wondering, these are Avery Square 2x2 labels, um, and the number is 22806. Um, 300 of those on Amazon for about 15 bucks. It works out to about five cents a label, so it, it's not too bad. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up. And if you have a question, wrap it up while I'm doing this last slide. This presentation was brought to you by... Home in Texas, we're a nonprofit organization that we advocate for home entrepreneurs and independents. We are working for the cottage food law and expanding the cottage food law. I've been doing it since 2009. Um, memberships are very inexpensive, starting at $20 up through $70 for a membership. Um, we would really appreciate your membership. Um, it's our members that made this evening possible, um, and I hope to have more of these. Um, interactive events focusing on certain subjects inside the cottage food law. Um, you can visit us at homemadetexas.org to learn more or become a member. And every person who joins will be mailed in the mail this uh, a guide to the cottage food law that has everything you need to know about the cottage food law in it. It is great for taking to markets. Um, and if you have a health inspector who says, hey, you can't sell that salsa here, you could say, oh, excuse me, I so can because it's right here in the book. So this comes with every membership. And if you're already a member and you didn't get one, just send me an email, home at homemadetexas.org, and I will get one out to you in the mail. Let's see. There's a few more questions that came in. Can the label not be stick on the container uh, only if your food doesn't have a container. If it's one of those foods that's the exception, like a wedding cake that doesn't have a box, if there's no packaging for your food, then you can hand the labeling information. You can print that on the invoice or the receipt and hand it to your customer. But if your food has a package, it needs to have a label on it. Okay, Sheila. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you guys for tuning in and for supporting me. I hope they get rid of the address having to be added in 2023. Oh, girl, <laughs> me too. Uh, some of you participated in the survey that I posted a month or two ago, and that came out real close to the top of everybody's list. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click the like button and hit subscribe to be notified when we post new content.